You are now listening to the African Growth Opportunities Podcast, where we share opportunities for Africans both in diaspora and on continent to develop, progress, and succeed in today's changing world. I'm your host, Udochi KK. And on today's episode, we will be talking to Chika Umedi, founder of Tip Hub. Um, welcome to the show, Chika. Um, can you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Hi, my name is Chika Yumedi, and I am the founder of Tip Hub, uh, one of the founders of Tip Hub. Tip Hub is a, a platform that uh, supports and partners with African and African diaspora startups at the intersection of technology and impact. Okay, um, so I looked into a little. I looked into a little bit about Tip Hub. Um, and the way that you guys um, kind of bridge the gap in terms of um, African, and I'm going to put a link to Tip Hub on this uh, broadcast, in terms of Africans in the diaspora um, as well as um, in continent Africa and the way you uh, bridge that gap uh, for people. My podcast, uh, my show focus is to um, – to educate Africans both in con- on continent and in the diaspora about opportunities for um, for growing, for getting into industry, um, for making money um, in today's digital age. Um, so we've had a lot of great guests, and today's guest, uh, Chika Umedi, is um, an amazing, very accomplished um, uh, entrepreneur, and I believe he has a lot of value to share with the with the audience today. Um, so I researched a little bit about Tip Hub, and I know that you're doing something in the realm of uh, bridging, create, becoming a bridge for people in the diaspora, along with people in Africa, to um, venture capital uh, money and resources and connections. Um, to start their business, and that's right up our alley because we're trying to help people understand through this podcast what exactly uh, what opportunities there are for them if they are interested in doing things in in um in getting out there. So, so I really would love to pick your brain in a way that can really be helpful for everybody today. Um. So uh, why don't you? I, have, I do have a very direct question about Tip Hub. So. Is this like an incubator program, or is it something that is a little bit more general? Can you give us a little bit more details about what TipHub does? So TipHub is, is more what I would like to call like an informal accelerator. Um, we, um, we have a very long-term vision in the way we engage with companies. And so a lot of the programs that we, a lot of the programs, a lot of partnerships we have, are very much focused on moving the needle slowly but su- slowly but surely um, with companies. Um, with our program, for example, the Ashford demo that we've had about three times now, um, it's it's a program that really takes an immersive perspective on how to support companies. So we bring the knowledge base and knowledge experience of the partners and of our exposure to startups or early stage startups. Um, we bring mentors, we bring um, resources from people like Facebook, Amazon, uh, SendGrid, and a bunch of other places, and then we bring this idea and concept of continuously, uh, continuous community um, support and accountability to bear, and we mix them all together, and we, that's what Diaspora Demo is. And through that process, companies go through a curriculum we've developed, they get matched with mentors, uh, they also um, get a chance to really engage with one another in an intimate way. Um, and so um, what happens what happens is that after that whole you know probably three to four month process, um, there's it, it culminates in an event um, where the companies come for a week, um, come for a week to central location, preferably Washington D.C. Well, it's been Washington D.C. most of the time, and we go. Th- you know, they get to meet each other. 
we get to do more hands-on learning, and then um, we have more intimate experience around meeting investors, meeting other stakeholders, and uh, that's kind of what it culminates in. So throughout this process, you get actually, you probably get a lot of information around what fundraising really looks like, um, like startup management. Um, you get exposure to you get exposure to um, you get exposure to you know what it looks like to look for people like bringing on your first or second group of a first or second employee. Um, it also goes into um, a bunch of other a bunch of other really like important nuances in the startup kind of exposure or the startup startup experience, and then like the nuances of building. Um, building or building organizations in places like you know places like Nigeria, or Ghana, Kenya, South Africa, etc. Um, and then an, another thing that really comes out of it that's really beneficial is um, another thing that comes out of these program this program that is really beneficial is the camaraderie between companies. Um, you know, Tip Hub is only as strong as the relationships we have with companies and stake other stakeholders. So. Um, companies kind of share their resources and uh, share the opportunities, and and they do a really good job of you know having conversations and supporting each other in a way that you know even with a hundred years of experience, will be you know the, the founders would never be able, or um, the partners at Tip Hub would never be able to. So um, that's kind of what we, in terms of support and in terms of engagement, that's what you know our that's kind of what our uh, that's how that's how we work. That is so fascinating. I love that. Um, but I am curious, and I know this will be the next question of any regular Joe Schmo that's listening to this, is that is all that wonderful stuff that you do for everybody, do they pay a fee to get into your program? At this time, no, they do not currently pay a fee. Uh, the way it works is that we normally work with, um, we normally work with companies um, later on in the conversation, like later on past after diaspora demo, and we say, you know, because we have a network of investors, you know, maybe what we'll do is we'll decide that we can um, we can help fundraise, and then you know, there's a you know a small finder's fee for helping to fundraise. Uh, so that's kind of mm. that's how we support. Um, that's how we you know kind of um, if we can help fundraise, then you know that's how we only get we only get we only get a monetary um, like monetary um, fee. If yeah, that's that's the that's the cash flow model for you guys. Side. Yeah. So um, the next question, I guess, is um, what what stage do the uh, do the uh, companies that come into your program? What stage do they need to be in? So mo most of the time, what we focus on is early, you know, early stage, and early stage for us is, um, you know, think of it this way: you have a product. You have a product in the market. You have customers. Um, you have you have some type of revenue coming in. It doesn't have to be significant, but you have some type of revenue coming in. Um, so it proves that there is. You know, it doesn't prove. You know, it doesn't necessarily prove the market opportunity, but it proves like there's a pain, and you've gotten people to identify the pain, um, and make. Uh, you know, and make. Maybe a you know maybe there has been a couple of, like transactions for revenue, um, so those are the kind of those are the kind of uh, metrics we look for. Um, we look for um, we also look for you know more than you know founders that um, or teams that have more than one founder. Um, mm -hmm. We look for you know uh, some kind of traction, um, some kind of you know um, business or uh, media traction um, mm -hmm. as well. Um, as signals, uh, and then there are a bunch of other things we look for. Um, but those are kind of the main ones. So there, there's a there's a vetting process. So that's great. Um, so my next question, I, I, I do want to have some fun. I don't want this to be 100% serious, but I want to uh, I want to give some people who may not be 100% familiar with the. Um, with uh, startup life, because what I really want to do with this interview is um, give people practical information about bridging a gap, about how you bridge that gap, and how they themselves can can be can get into the um, 
the startup culture and just the opportunities that are that are available there because that is your expertise. Now, um, uh, as I understand it, um, I lost my question. Oh, um, there was an interview. You, you did an interview on, I believe, the Global Startup Movement uh, podcast, and where you said that you, if I'm not mistaken, um, there's a difference between their challenges, their significant, their um, unique challenges that uh, the people in Africa who are trying to get access to capital and resources and people, um, there are unique challenges that they have that um, that are not that are that are different from the ones that uh, we see here in the uh, the um, the West or in any country that is uh, more uh, more privileged in terms of have, ac having access to resources, uh, more developed nations. So, so can you um, talk a little bit about the problems that you see there? I know you mentioned relationships, having relationships and access to capital as being one of them. Um, and I don't want to reiterate completely what happened in that interview. I'll just link that interview for those interested. Um, but I guess, can you talk a little bit about um, how the differences, the different types of problems that uh, somebody who might be in those situations have? And I'm going to lead that into a more fun question right afterwards. Oh, definitely, definitely. Um, so some of the, the key challenges that I see, um, especially on the capital side, right, um, they're because of the way, because there's such an inherent risk in early stage business um, due to just like the operational realities of most businesses and the lack of infrastructure in a lot of, a lot of African countries, um, the operational risk is just very large at the early stage. Um, and most investors are just going to want to find a way to not have to deal with that. They, or they want to figure out, um, they want to talk to you once you've figured out a lot of those um, a lot of those opportunities, and it, it, it often requires a lot of toying around with your business model, um, and that in itself, that uh, that that risk that exists, um, often makes it really challenging to raise capital at the early stage, um, for a couple of reasons. So one, um, it does, you know, I believe, I believe that, you know, for a lot of these like scalable opportunities, it takes a while to find a business model that is very scalable in um, in an African, like oftentimes in an African context, and takes a lot of upward up upfront investment. Uh, so your 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 clip size is going to be a little bit larger than traditional in traditional companies that um, or their counter your counterparts in other parts of the world. Um, so that's one issue. Then the second thing is that from there. Um, the 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 invest the um, the um, what I like to call like the palette for risk is high is lower in um, emerging markets in, in emerging market countries like um, in emerging market countries in Africa than the rest of the world um, because because there are just so many the early stage so the early stage venture capital early stage angel space is oftentimes Competing for ass for competing for cash um, with other asset classes and other asset classes that are safer um, and other asset classes that um, have more demands for returns um, and so there's just not as much allocation to the venture capital space in a way that's beneficial for um, that early stage money in. Um, you'll see that, you know, even though there's been a lot of activity, I think um, according to an article from CNN um, a couple of weeks ago, like there's been almost, you know, I think like double of venture capital investment in Africa since 2017. Um, but mm -hmm. I, if you would look at that, most of that money is going into growth stage or later stage opportunities, so Series A, Series B opportunities. But there's still that like missing middle for how do we bridge that gap between 
you know, the early stage opportunities and then people getting to like, you know, Series A. There's still a gap there because that's the mm -hmm. that's the that's probably the most uh, risky set of investments that you could make. Um, but you know, that's not to say that we're do there. There are things being done to mitigate that. There are a lot of really great, especially like Nigeria, for example. They run a lot of great, really great accelerator programs and um, a lot of entrepreneurs that are just making it on their own using their you know using you know innovative approaches, uh, really just solving. And getting those things done in a way that is beneficial, and you know, there's money coming into them. So, but it's just, it's just on the average more challenging for an entrepreneur in that space. Right. Let me stop you because that's a, that's a lot you put, you said there, and I definitely want to break it down for listeners okay. who might be a little bit more on the lay side and might not okay. understand a lot of the um, complex things you said there. So. Basically, uh, what I'm going to you know reiterate. Basically, what it seems like you're saying is that um, a lot of the kind of grow, like seed, you know, the companies that are just kind of getting started in Africa, specifically in, like you said, in emerging market African countries, which is basically like if you are starting from ground zero, maybe in some village in, uh, you know, Timbuktu, um, and you are trying to start a company. And you have, you know, very little going for you. It's going to be very difficult for you to find money to, um, to or money or you know resources and things like that to get you to the point where you're the next Dangote <laughs> because it's just there are many things, many things you're competing with, and you're not just even if you're you're building an app, for example, you're not just competing with other people building apps or other people building similar apps, you're also competing with um, other ways in which people, specifically investors, who would be interested in giving money to someone to grow that money through business investments, um, but they may find something a little bit more stable to invest in, like you know, bank notes or something like that, which probably would give them a greater return on their investment than something that's been untested. Am I correct in in, in, in it so far? Exactly exactly. And then, you know, those 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 bonds, for example, are, you know, less risk and more consistent, right? So you may not get like a ten X return on bonds, your the bond market, but you're definitely gonna get gradual returns if you put money in, right? So um it it the the risk profile for a lot of African investors is just a little, just a little, you know, it's it's a, uh, it's 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 a risky investment to be for, but so and then also, another okay. an, a, another thing I'd like to add to that is that even outside of venture, so you know there there are very specific companies that should go after venture capital, right? That's a you know I I believe that if you you know you have to prove that you're you're because you you have to understand and this is where like you know we do a lot of work with this at tip up too um you mm -hmm. have to understand that if you're taking a venture if you're taking the venture avenue venture capital avenue in terms of um um looking for that type of money you have to understand that the you have to be you have to empathize with the venture capital investor right um they're not going to be looking for you know, you have to be able to grow a company um, and be able to return that money into them in an impactful way for their fund, right? So think about mm -hmm. it this way: if you take if you take a hundred thousand dollars from a, a you know a venture capital investor, um, how can you, you have to think about? Okay, we took that money at this cost. At, at this, this is the size of our company. How do we grow mm -hmm. our company to you know? Most most VCs are going to say, "How can you grow that 10x?" But most of the time, your your question should be, "How how can you grow that to three to four x?" So their return is three to four x of what they put in, right? Okay, so that um, so they're they're looking for someone who can tell them, "Okay, by we're going to be able to bring we're going to be able to to uh, multiply we're going to be able to um uh, I don't know how to say that, but to multiply your your what you give us by ten, um so that we can. So, 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 so that you'll get a return on your investment, and you're actually making more money that you can then go and reinvest. And because you're kind of, you know, the, when people give you money, they expect you to give them more back so that they can continue to. Uh, that's how they build their wealth. They're not giving you free money. 
Exactly. And so you have to understand how the venture capital space works when you're going down venture, like venture avenue, right? And, and another key challenge that, uh, that's another key challenge that, um, that people, I mean, I think venture capital investors and entrepreneurs face, that everybody feels like they can go to venture capital, right? But the, the real challenge behind all of that is that there's just also not enough, you know, loan transactions there's not enough grants there's not enough there's not enough um there's not enough um non-vc money on the ground for smes in general right so What's small, SME? and medium size, uh, small and medium-sized businesses are not necessarily taking venture route to scale they're they want to operate in a small and medium-sized market right and that oftentimes um, a lot of, a lot of, especially like technology entrepreneurs will say, you know, I, you know, I'm going to go seek venture capital, but maybe venture capital isn't the best option just because of those demands on growth. But maybe, you know, going to a bank and, you know, getting a loan to do X, Y, and Z and then slowly repaying the loan is a better option. But if you look at a lot of, you know, it's very hard for untested SMEs to get loans um, you know, in places like Nigeria, right? Mm-hmm. And so that's also there's just a there's a there's a monetary like choke on like the on on early stage companies, be it like venture back venture venture stage or venture like a venture track companies or companies mm-hmm. that want to just grow into small and medium sized businesses. And so mm-hmm. that's just an overall issue that that makes it challenging for companies. Um, there, mm-hmm. there are a ton of other issues, but I, I just want to, like, I think it's just important to take, a lot of people complain about the access to capital challenge, but mm-hmm. it's a little more complex and nuanced than we give it credit. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you, especially now having that conversation. Um, now, the next question, uh, this is a quick sidebar, what industries do you generally work with with Tip Hub? Like, what kind of industries like um, as far as like companies are you is tip hub open to working with all industries or is it like we don't do entertainment we don't do you know do you guys have a niche yeah so um instead of um instead of specifically focusing on industries we kind of have um we have three pillars to the kind of nonprofits is the other like. question i have um yeah, we have three pillars as to the kind of mm-hmm. the kind of um, opportunities we like to explore. Um, so number one, um, number one, we like uh, companies that are market organizers. So market organizers in the sense that they bring um, buyers and sellers together in a very scalable scalable way. They're market creators. Like for example, bringing small and medium sized farmers to um, to together to um, buy and uh, buy or sell to like large scale or large scale suppliers right or large scale um, buyers right like that's a prime example of a company we'd be interested in we actually we were we are interested in um, we um, we made a, an investment last year um, but that's that's an example of like a market organizer the second thing we're interested in is companies that help um, decrease the cost of doing business um, so um, companies that help decrease the cost of doing business are normally most of the time like SaaS companies or companies that have figured out a way to, um, you know, automate some processes around, you know, maybe hiring people or maybe um, maybe um, figuring out a very complex process within, you know, business and then um, being able to provide a product that serves a solution. Um, a third third. Thing that we're a third um, kind of the third type of company that we're really interested in is companies that help improve insights for customers and businesses and um, government. Uh, so you're looking at um, reporting, analytics, um, big data type companies. Um, that's the kind of those are the kind of companies that we're interested in. And what we find, in, in, and you have to layer all on top of all of this, is that the biggest driver for us is impact and we believe that these three areas um, these three areas kind of um, they focus on showing the key 
um, they're, the, they're some of the key drivers of any economy, right? Um, insight, um, decreasing business expenses, and organizing markets. We believe that those are key areas within uh, kind of growing any market um, or any, any economy. And so we look for, we look for companies that do that. Um, but if we look back to the companies that we've engaged with over time, uh, we've been interested, you know, companies, we've, healthcare has been one. Healthcare is an industry that constantly gets, um, gets attention from us. Education is a space that gets attention. Um, um, uh, what's another one? Um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Um, the B two B kind, of, the B two B space in terms of B two B solutions is something that we were really interested in. Um, mm -hmm. We haven't really seen any. We, we've oh no, that's a, that's a, that's a lie. Um, entertainment is also one. Um, entertainment in a way that is more of a platform play than just like one off projects. And then um, and then another place for us that's interesting. Another industry for us that ends up being interesting as a result of the space that um, we're interested in is um, is like I said that um, that government kind of government implementation like government uh, larger government solutions space. Uh, so those are kind of the areas that we find ourselves um, picking from. Um, but mm -hmm. you know, we're really like we're really honestly we're industry agnostic. Um, but you know, it definitely. You know, just because of the way things are, the biggest challenges often reflect in the kind of companies we see. That's phenomenal. I think it's really, I think that's really insightful for a lot of people who might be listening and might think, um, like, where to begin. And I really, that's the that's the heart of really what I want to get at um, with this interview. Now, now that we kind of understand a little bit about the landscape of like the problems that people might arise, uh, that might arise for some people who might go from, oh, I have this business idea, I don't know, I found this podcast, they said that there are problems getting money to villages and stuff like that. Um, what is your feeling about optimism for people like that? Like what kind of uh, advantages do you think that they might have or what kind of opportunities are there? Because you did mention earlier that there are people um, – laying some groundwork to, br to bridge those little, uh, the gap between uh, somebody who might be working in a village in Africa and come up with an idea for an app, for example, or come up with an idea for um, some kind of, you know, infrastructural project, and now they need the funds to, to or funds or resources or something to take it from, oh, I had this idea to, you know, let's get going. So, what, what, who, like, who do you know? Do you know any specific uh, people or organizations or um, initiatives that might currently exist that could help them go from idea to some kind of movement? Yeah. So there, I mean, there are a couple of pointers I have. Um, well, there are a couple of things that I see, and then there are a couple of pointers that I have for founders that are really looking to to move the throttle on that on that level. Uh, so one, you know, I think there are a lot of um, non-governmental organizations. There are a lot of government. There are a lot of governments, and there are a lot of investors that see this as a key challenge. And they're looking for ways to. Um, they're looking for ways to prov to, to to decrease the the chokehold on capital in the early stage. Uh, you know, Dan no, not Dangote. Excuse me. Uh, Tony Alomalu just signed a um, a deal with I think the Asian uh, Development Bank um, for UBA to allow them to. Um, channel, you know, um, I think millions or billions of dollars in loans to SMEs, right? So um, people understand, you know, uh, people especially like Tony Lumalu understand that the lifeblood and the continuous development of our countries, of his countries that he serves in, with at UBA, uh, United Bank of Africa, um, are going, the only way that we're going to provide um, provide the type of growth that we're looking for is through SME development, and he is definitely one of those. He's one of those people that believe in um, that are doing, you know, like are talking the talk and walk, walking the walk and talking the talk to pro, um, to to create a conducive uh, situation for SMEs. So that's on the larger level. There are 
also government programs that are starting to rise that are giving grants. Um, I know, um, for example, um, you know, um, Nigerian, uh, Leg or, uh, Leg I think it was Nigeria or Lagos State Government, you know, gives vouchers, Lagos State Government gives vouchers to um, entrepreneurs for, you know, to figure out where to, um, you know, they're looking for places to, like, work. So they get vouchers to stay in, um, they get vouchers to, like, pay for their co-working spaces. And that, you know, that's the type of funding that, once again, decreases operational costs, so it's helpful. Uh, so a lot of, you know, there are people doing things, uh, the governments are doing things. Is it at the speed and rapid rate that we need? No. But slowly but surely, there are things being done on the, you know, governmental, non-governmental, private sector side. Um, as a founder, I think it, in a cash-strapped society, it takes a very nuanced approach around who your first money in uh, should be, right? And I think... Um, I'll say this. I, I I can't take credit for it, but um, it was in my uh, when I was a when I was a venture, when I did venture capital in uh, in in the United States. One of the uh, we we ran an accelerator uh, in Washington D.C. And one of the things that always stuck with me is that your first investor should be your customer. Um, and so, how do you, as a founder, find a way to um, as a founder? Um, as a founder, how do you find a way to um, extract value from your customer or develop a product or a solution that's good enough for your customer to really actually bank your growth? Um, mm -hmm. And that's the key. I think that will be like the uh, that 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 key will be the the the, the way that um, the way that uh, you know a lot of founders will get past that. Um, early stage kind of crutch of capital, right? And um, customers, if customers have a strong enough pain point, if customers are willing to pay for you to solve that pain point, then you should immerse yourself in getting as many customers as possible to solve that in a way that's valuable to you and also valuable to the mm -hmm. customer. And once you get there, you know, you may figure out that you don't even need venture capital or you don't need a loan. Um, but it, it's challenging. It's hard. Um, but you know, it's one of those things that a lot of you know. A lot of times, you want to be the captain of your own ship, right? You don't want mm -hmm. to have people telling you that you know you have to return capital to us in three to four years, or you know you don't want to have to wake up every morning thinking you have to you know, oh my loan my loan fee is due for today, or um, the loan I took from the bank is due today, so. Um, one of the the easiest ways, um, one of the easiest is, is not easy, but one of the best ways to grow organically is through your customer. Uh, so I would, you know, for anyone that's looking at, you know, strategies around that, that's a, that's a whole other conversation. But that is where um, that is where I see the pathway to a lot of founders. Um, that are wanting to grow their company in a responsible way, uh, that's, that's the path that I would normally recommend. Okay. Um, I still want to, because I feel like a lot of people who, I, the, well, the few people that I know that are currently, I know my, my podcast is not the biggest, but I know a few people who do listen, and they're not, and they're, some of them even in Nigeria, who are interested in growing, or most of them want to come to America, um, or, you know, somewhere in the West to, for, to look for opportunities. But it sounds like because of the market you're in, you might be a little bit optimistic about um, what is possible. So I do want to, uh, I do want to I, well, I hope this is fun for you, but it's, it's going to take a little bit of creative muscle. I uh, want to see what your, what your advice would be to uh, someone who might be who might have to overcome any of these particular problems, it might not. I don't know. It might be hard, um, but try, we'll try. And I'll definitely, you know, uh, we'll all forgive you if you if you're not able to think of something. But um, so if you are, say, let's say you're an entrepreneur in Africa, and you have any of the follow up, I'm going to just list the problem, and you can kind of give a suggestion about how to solve it if you can think of anything, um, mm -hmm. and you want to get past one of these problems. Um, how do you foresee, and this is just common problems that you would have in, a, in an emerging market, uh, you foresee coming, getting past, for example, let's just say you are 
a founder and your problem is inconsistent electricity. Um, this is a very abstract problem. It could be it, maybe you, it, the person could either want to start a business or maybe they already have an idea, maybe they don't have an idea, maybe they just want to start a business. Like what, do you, what would you tell somebody who is like, I want to start a business, I want to make money, but electricity isn't consistent, and I don't think I'll be able to make it. What would you tell someone like that? So, I mean, so for me, you know, these are these are major problems for me. Like, I, outside of tip up, there are a lot of things I do in Nigeria that energy plays a significant role. Um, so, for me, when I think about um, when I think about the key key challenges or the key the key ways to solve for this for me has been for, for one of the companies where like uh, we've, um, we've invested in we've actually you know it's so it's a product development company software developers like making mobile and web applications so what we've done is instead of you know we had a very remote policy for the first year or so um, but we realized that we were missing deadlines and we were missing deadlines because Electricity and internet were inconsistent, right? So we, I mean, we made the investment into you know um, into co-working spaces. So we've made it a policy that you have to spend four out of five days at the co-working space, right? The, and the reality behind that is that co-working spaces have consistent electricity, consistent mm -hmm. more consistent electricity, more consistent more consistent internet, right? Um, so. Um, the 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 lesson behind that isn't that isn't that oh you have to move somewhere that has consistent electricity and consistent um, internet access is that we've removed we removed the operational risk of electricity out of our business model right for now oh well like not all, not not totally but for now right um, so my question would be you know. What does it look like to a founder to remove? And I know this, especially for something as basic as electricity, what does it take for you to remove the risk, operational risk of electricity from your business model? Right. Um, another example is, you know, um, my father is working on a manufacturing facility in Lagos, and one of the key risks we have is that, you know, once again, um, oil or gas, um, lack of like or like inconsistent electricity is a huge risk for our operational model, right? There are a lot of chemicals that can't you can't you can't not have twenty four seven electricity, you know, and manufacture chemicals like it just doesn't make any sense, right? So our question our question was how do we remove that operational risk from our business model? And what we came up with was you know developing us or like a excuse me, developing an energy portfolio that isn't specifically reliable or relying on reliant on the the grid, um, but it takes it uses of the grid as part of the overall solution for the energy uh, energy um, challenges uh, for the energy um, delivery for the manufacturing facility. So once again, it's not the fact that we went out and we developed this portfolio of solutions is that we removed that as a risk from our business model. And so it may, it definitely took upfront investment and upfront capital, but those are the things, you know, if electricity is a challenge, how do I remove it? How do I move that as a, remove that as a challenge for me? Does it mean that I, you know, buy solar panels, I invest in solar panels, does it mean that I have to only work um, during the day, or do I have to work during the night, or do I have to work? You know, are there, are there do I have to work out of a hotel, or are there places that I can? You know, so how, there, there, you know, you just have to start thinking of ways that you can remove that from. And if you can't, then that's just something that maybe you're going to have to stomach for now, and as you mm -hmm. grow, and then you can deal with it. Um, but that's that's how I would. That's how I would approach it. That's fantastic. I think that's excellent advice. Um, so I want to. I, I still want to hit the, the the other three. So um, I don't know how much more time you have. Obviously, like if you if you can 
you know, keep your answers short if you, if you have to go. But if you have time, I, I'm here too. So you can definitely um, ex expound on your um, responses if you have time to do so. Sure. So I'm going to ask yeah. you, I'm going to uh, throw three more at you. I'm going to tell you them up front, and then you can hit them. And then I have one more big question that I want to ask at the end because I feel like it's really super duper um, relevant at this this time in our um, in the in the world. Um, so uh, the last three are transportation, corruption, and being around poor people. Um, if someone came to you and they said, "I want to start a business. I'm trying to figure it out," but the problem I have is there's too much corruption in my country, or uh, the transportation isn't consistent, or it's just everyone's poor and no one knows what to do, or whatever. Um, let's start. You can start wherever you want with that. But like, how do you tackle these types of issues when you're in that country? You can pick one, and we can go through the list, and you can just give one example or something. But um, definitely, um, yeah, no, definitely. Um, so I think from an entrepreneur mindset, like you have to. I have to do like mental judo with a lot of these challenges and see them as opportunities, right? Um, mm -hmm. for, for people that have, you know, people that live in poverty or people that are often considered poor are some of the biggest, at scale, are, you know, the biggest markets in Africa, right? Like if you really think about it, like a lot of, there are a lot of, there are a lot of people living in poverty but they still have needs, right? And your ability to deliver those needs in a cost-effective way is what's going to, is, is actually um, oftentimes a bigger market opportunity than, um, bigger market opportunity than, you know, delivering, you know, um, 10, it, delivering, you know, services to 2% of the population, right? So mm -hmm. um, with, uh, with people that, you know, what, what I, you know, probably call bottom of the pyramid folks, um, that takes a lot of service, service and product development innovation up front. Um, if you're, if there, so, and a lot of, um, and a lot of, and a lot of like just empathy around the overall experience, right? So, for example, you know, yes, there are a lot of, you know, for example, there are a lot of people living, you know, with minimal amount of bringing in a minimal amount of money in Nigeria, but their kids still go to school, right? So what it means is that school is still valued, but their mo a lot of their money is going to the kids going to school. So, and, and our, a question there would be, for example, how do we, you know, how do you make it easier for what? What's a, what is a real challenge around poverty, right? And I would argue that um, individually. Like people don't make a lot of money, but if you in, if you look like in aggregate, I mean they still don't make a lot of money in aggregate, like per annum. But there is an opportunity to say, okay, this isn't just a this isn't just a poverty issue, but it's a cash flow issue. How can we, you know, create a situation where we empower you know people to make better payments, understanding that their cash flow is what the challenge is, right? So. Um, that's where you get into the conversation of like micro insurance. Um, mm -hmm. You get into insure, like micro lending, things like that. Those are solutions that come about as a result of of understanding that we need to adjust the delivery method and we need to adjust the assumptions we have on um, the the bottom of the pyramid population. And so, what kind of adjustments and what kind of nuances do you have to make for people in poverty? Um, that that's the question that I would ask in your specific market or specific segment, and then you know if you think about it and you you do the math and you're saying okay to really like move the move the needle I need to you know uh, approach I need to create a product or service that reaches this many you know um, this many bottom of the pyramid um, um, people. Um, then you can start to like think about okay, does it really make sense, or is there something I can build that can get, actually get the two percent, and can I use the two percent to fund um, up going after the you know the ninety the ninety the you know the ninety five percent or whatever you know ninety seven or ninety eight percent of people or um, so it, it just takes a little bit more of thinking outside the box on you know, what kind of service delivery you're looking at and then all, like, what kind of product and service development you're looking at and then also um, the economics of it all and being able to uh, think through how to really, um, it, you know, drive margins or drive, 
the kind of um, support that you need to get that group of people. Um, so that's um, I was that was, I would say for people in poverty, um, if you're if you're looking to serve a market for people in poverty, I think there's an opportunity there. Um, and if you're not looking, if you're looking to start a business, but you say a lot of people are in poverty, then um, if that's not your you know segment, then you have nothing to worry about. Um, but you should w realize that if you know if 98% of the population is considered in poverty, and there's 2% of the population that isn't, then that's you know that's just a smaller market size, which means it might be a little bit more challenging and a little bit more competitive because there's probably mm -hmm. somebody, probably three or four people doing the exact same thing for that 2% of the population and probably better connected and better funded. So like, you know, that's, that, that, those are just things to think about. Um, in terms of corruption, corruption is something that um, founders, uh, founders done actually, I, so, um, so founders deal with this directly and indirectly, right? So corruption exposes itself um, not to like get into like a, you know like a whole like philosophy discussion, but like mm. from corruption exposes itself directly on the founder, like in terms of bribes, in terms of um, in terms of um, in terms of like direct costs, like bribes, um, like trying like the run around around the sale, like closing the sales, like all this other stuff, and indirectly in like infrastructure and the realities and the, the mistrust that exists in the uh, ecosystem. So um, for me, um, trust is there. So corruption is one of those things that I, up until now, I don't know how to deal with it. Is it something that I've had to deal with? Yes. Um, but the way that, you know, just the way that I, the way that I, the way that I've dealt with it historically is just dealing with, like, is, is, is actually bringing is being very transparent about it and saying that these are the realities and, and including that in my budgetary like constraint, like by budgetary like padding padding budgets, you know, around like the realities that, okay, well, the transportation from this to this, the transportation for this location to this location, you know, is not just fuel and, you know, human hours, right? There's a little bit more that goes into that, right? Um, and unfortunately, like that's the reality, right? But I think corruption is one of those things that I think every founder is going to have their way of operating. Um, and um, yeah, I, 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 I think I kind of get what you're saying. It's one of those things where, as a founder, you just have to be realistic. You have to you have to deal with reality. I think that's the, what cold hard truth about if you want to go into business, if you're not ready to deal with reality, if you want to be you know, um, you know, Pollyanna about everything. You might not want to go into business or entrepreneurship, but if you want to do something, if you want to go into entrepreneurship, you're going to have to deal with the cold, hard facts of reality. And it's not in a terrible way. It's just in a way that it's like, okay, there are real things that entrepreneurs have to deal with. They have to deal with budgets. They have to deal with, you know, knowing their demographic. They have to deal with knowing their industry and knowing their, you know, the environment that they're going to be working in. And if these are one of the constraints, if this is one of the issues that you're going to face, i.e. corruption, um, you have to make the hard decision. Like, am I going to, like you said, potentially, you know, fit in your budget? For example, in Nigeria, like I think that's what you were alluding to, in Nigeria when you're driving from, if you want to go from Lagos to Port Accord or whatever via car, um, there will be some police officers with guns on the road who are going to be like, you know, where's my, where's my money, Mr. Big Shot? And, um, and you, you're going to have to know that that's money that you're going to have to do. But at the, end of, at the same time, you don't want, like, your, your books to be unbalanced because there's money that you have to use to take care of that so it's something that you're going to have to put in as a line item, like transportation equals this plus this extra money. You know, you got to put that number in there so that you can make sure everything is, you know, exactly how it should be, keeping in mind the integrity of your company. So um, is that does that summarize it for you? Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, so, so – but if somebody, well, I guess I, I don't want to, like, belabor the point, but I was going to potentially, you know, also if somebody is like, I just can't deal in that environment, then maybe it's not for you. Maybe you should go to a, do a business in, like, 
Switzerland or something, or but if you are committed to, in my opinion, this is me speaking, obviously, um, if you're committed to entering into that market and well, uh, I think I've got this phrase from you, rolling up your sleeves and like getting in there with, um, yeah. with, with the people of, of Africa mm-hmm. or of an emerging market, you don't have to be open. You have to go in there with both eyes open and, and know what, the, what mm-hmm. the environment you're dealing with is and commit. And, mm-hmm. and, there's, and I mean, honestly, there's corruption everywhere. Like, you know, I think it, it's just like uh, it's more of a cultural, I think it's just a little bit more pervasive. You know, we could argue that it's a little bit more pervasive in a lot of the mm-hmm. countries we're discussing, but like, you know, um, you know, after a while, for example, you know, you as a startup in the United States, if you get to, if you get large enough, you have to, you know, buy you have to get lobby. You have to you have to have a whole like um policy um arm that you have to spend millions of dollars maintaining to lobby to a Congress that is supposed to, you know, develop rules for you, right? So you know, let, let, you know that that in itself is a bribe in a sense, and and mm-hmm. those are you know it. I, I think it's just contextually, like like you you mentioned, you just have to once again go in there with both eyes open, right? Because a lot of these founders in the United States that are building a lot of these bigger companies understand that after you get to like Series C or after you get to like a Series, like you, after you grow to a certain stage, you're gonna have to um, you're gonna have to really push policy, or if you're working in a very like emergent like industry or nascent industry, you're going to have to be uh, pushing policy in a way that is beneficial for your business model, and they know what mm-hmm. that means, right? And that so, and they know that means enough to bring on a head of policy, uh, a solid legal team that's going to have to push that agenda in a way that means dining, you know, con- con- Congress members and and having an office in dc that does policy work but is really just like lobbying folks so you know those are all things that you know that's that's done that's the united states side but we have our own things that we have to deal with as well in the early stage um maybe it, it maybe it's not like once you get to a certain stage but it's the realities of dealing with it um with with limited resources and i think that's the constraint for many um, founders, how do we deal with corruption when you know we don't even you know? How do we deal with like the the, the, the corruption in the many ways that it takes on in ways that's still beneficial for our business model? And unfortunately, that's still an operational risk that you know on the investor side we see and we have to account for on our end in terms of an investment mm-hmm. decision. Makes absolute sense. Um, the last one was transportation. Did you want to touch on that? Like if someone yeah, tra- issues, yeah, yeah. So transportation is a tough one. Um, um, I really so I don't have like I don't have a solution to that at all. Um, I would say you know, can you operate once again? Can you you know? I think it goes back to what we were saying about elect- um, electricity. Can you operate in a way that decreases the operational risk around transportation? So um, you know, can you instead of trying to go citywide, like, instead of, like, trying to, like, take over Lagos, right, can you say, I'm going to just deal with Yaba for now, or I'm going to deal with the Koi for now, and instead of, so, instead of, you know, if you're going to, like, if, so, like, let's say, hypothetically, like, this is part of your business model, right, so, like, if, you know, let's say I have, like, a banana delivery service, I don't even know, um, mm-hmm. like, can I just deal with, can I just deal with, like, specific estates, you know, like Dolphin Estate, you know, you know, can I just say I'm going to deal with this specific estate in, in, um, in this, like, Ikoi area and then, you know, use, like, structure my, su- structure my supply chain so that we can, like, get that, we can get those bananas to a specific place and then instead of, you know, trying to go all over the place, I have limited things, I have limited parts of my business model exposed to the transportation risk, and maybe transportation in itself is like, what am I using to deliver these things? So, am I, you know, using motorcycles versus bikes versus cars, etc. Right? Uh, KK, you know. So, like, those are all things that you can think about, right? And if you're using a bike, that could get rid of the transportational risk around like gas and the the you know not having not having you know having to, you know, wait in line to get gas for your, your motorcycles or whatnot or kickers or whatever. Mm. Or your cars, right? Or um or, you know, if you're like let's say, you know, that's one part of it. 
you know, maybe you can also think about um, how do I offshore, how do I offload my risk in that, right? So, for example, maybe you hire a company to deliver bananas to you, and then you just distribute those bananas, right? So mm-hmm. instead of owning that part of the value chain, right, you only owe, you you own the last mile of the value chain where you've established a competitive where you've eliminated the transportation risk essentially, right? Um, mm-hmm. So that's, I mean, it, in, the, in a lot of these, it's, you can't, I mean, like, for example, you can't outsource, or it's not that you can't, like, outsource electricity to someone else, right? But um, you still have to manage that for you, whatever you're doing. But mm-hmm. um, with transportation, there are ways you can play around with your value chain that will um, offload the risk for you, um, but then you're heavily reliant and you're heavily dependent on another person or another part of another company to make sure that they deal with that risk in a way that's beneficial for you. Um, so it's it's a it's a tight it's a tight walk it's a tight rope walk. Uh, but uh, that's I think those are like the two things I would say. You know, figure out one how ways you can mitigate your transportation risk. So um, doesn't mean like starting hyper local and looking for market saturation that way, and then being able to expand your model um, that way? Or is it something that, um, or is it something that you can out, you know, offshore, like outsource your, outsource parts of your value chain so you can take, so you don't have to take on limited risk? It may mean like a decrease in margins, but it also may mean um, that, you know, that's just an added, added risk you don't have to deal with. That is excellent advice because I think you touched on something that I think is really key. A lot of people want to get rich so quickly that they're not really open to the idea of starting small. Like just, okay, I, like you said, have a delivery company and I want to, you know, I want it to cover all of Africa or all of Nigeria. And, you know, all of a sudden they're like, oh, I've got to buy these buses and all these things like that, and it's like you don't have the resources to do that. Why don't you start small? Why don't you just deliver them to the people in your neighborhood first, um, the money you get from that, reinvest it into your company, and then take it to the next level, the the neighboring villages or the neighboring neighborhoods, and, um, and continue to grow and expand like that. A lot of people want to get this windfall and just start, you know, taking over the world when they have barely been able to, you know, manage their block, you know. So I think that's a really, really, really key uh, thing. Like, I think transportation, like you were saying, you seemed like you were a little hesitant about transportation at the beginning, but I think think you absolutely got it with that response because – um, there's a because even though I mean transportation is a lot of things. It's the issue of poor roads. It's the issue of, but mm-hmm. no matter what the issue is, um, as far as transportation is concerned, I think at the end of the day it's a capital issue because if you don't have enough money, then you can't get you know the type of vehicles that can drive on those terrible roads or you know the num or the gas or whatever the case may be. So if you can you know find a way to capitalize on whatever you have right where you are, you know, and then make the maximum amount that you need to take your, take yourself to the next level in terms of making enough consistent income to, um, to bridge that gap, then you can grow it and buy maybe a bigger vehicle or more vehicles or, you know, whatever other types of things you need to grow your, your business. So I think, I think that was a really good answer. I really, really like that answer. Um, so I, could go in so many directions right now. I have like I still have a lot of types of things, uh, but I'm just gonna wrap it up at this point because we've been. Uh, um, this is not Tim Ferriss's podcast that goes on for two hours. This is just <laughs> this is below me. So um, I'm going to uh, wrap it up with a very with this question that I was just like, this is the one that I want to ask you. Um, in your Brookings uh, article that you you published in, um, I think. It was on the. I think the news. The the thing is called Brookings. The um, publication is called Brookings or something. Of course, anyway, Foresight was, Africa. Yeah, the, the Foresight Africa report. Yeah. Yes. Um. It said. Um. It was. You know, talking about. You know, th- that emerging markets should embrace globalization, um, while still in protecting indigenous industries. No, that's not the point. The point that I wanted to hit on was, you were saying that. Um. I did like that point though about like protecting 
the indigenous industries because that's like something I'm really big on. I really love the idea. I really, I really like a diehard um, protect, you know, the indigenous industries, the indigenous languages, the indigenous, you know, what makes Africa Africa, protect that. Like I don't think it's possible to to make any kind of headway in Africa without preserving those things. I think the reason why Africa has had a problem is because people have focused so much on turning it into um, what, you know, the other parts of the world are doing and not thinking more about, okay, let's do something that's um, – that 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 can that's native or organically stems comes out of what they naturally do there, um, and so that's the thing that I, that, that that really that that's that's something I'm really passionate about. But uh, my final question is is this: Everyone's excited about Black Panther. Everyone's excited about that movie. Everybody's talking about Wakanda, um, and there were and you said in, I believe it was the Brookings article that. Uh, what did I write that down? Uh, something related to the fact that um, there are possible ways or that, that it's important for um, the people in the diaspora um, who, to, uh, to, you said that you would have liked to touch on, no, actually this was on your blog, you said you would have liked to touch on the fact that people in the diaspora have opportunities or the ways in which people in the diaspora could um, could help the people in, um, in in Africa, if I'm not mistaken, in various ways of entrepreneurship through, I believe it was funding, and I don't know if you remember what I'm, what I'm trying to remember, but, um, oh, here oh, it is. Yes, I, yeah, found yeah. It. I found it. So you said, um, the, you said that in the Foresight Africa report that uh, the diaspora's role in advancing entrepreneurship and technological advances and have a role in, can have, and you said, um, that they could have roles in funding, idea exchange, and implementation. Can you expound on what that would look like practically? Um, okay. Um, how, how familiar are you with the Black Panther comics? I, I'm not. Like, I never got into the – I was never – well, I did read comic books when I was little. Black Panther, but Marvel okay. wasn't one of them, and I wasn't, like, a big comic book head. Okay. But, um, so I'm yeah. going to try not to, like, jump totally into it, but, like, the reason... That means so you the, can always give background. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the reason... So um, if you look at, like, the techno technological advancement of, like, Wakanda, it, it definitely did not happen. Like, it didn't happen overnight, right? Like, Vibranium was there, mm -hmm. but what it happened over, like, I think the process of, like, let's say 100 years, right? Um, and, well, no, actually, it happened in, like, the process of, like, 60 years. And... Um, Essentially, what happened was like Prince T'Chaka's T'Chaka, no, no, King T'Chaka, so T'Challa's father, uh, King T'Chaka's um, wife, first wife, um, so Shruti's mother, or Shruti's, in, um, I think it was Shruti's mother, um, went, uh, well, T'Challa and Shruti's mother went to, she went abroad, and she was brilliant. She went abroad, uh, she studied at the best schools studied at the best, like, institutions, did the most research, and then came back to Wakanda and essentially, like, modernized Wakanda in the over the course of, like, you know, Wakanda was already going over, under modernization. T'Chaka was really, like, the spearhead of that. Um, but the, the transformation that Wakanda goes through actually happens under um, um, her, so T'Chaka's, or T'Chaka's, T'Chaka's first wife um, happens under her, kind of her purview, like the advancements in life sciences and research and all of that. All of that really just catalyzes around her. Um, and mm -hmm. so the way that I like to like explain it when I think about you know when I think about um, when I think about like how the diaspora can get involved and get active, um, I think that model works right. You know, if you look at you know, I mean, after you know. Um, uh, President Trump made that a uh, comment. The President of the United States, Donald Trump, made that comment around, um, you know, um, uh, around how he felt about specific countries in Africa um, and Haiti. Mm, and Haiti. Um, mm -hmm. um, after he made that comment, you know, a lot of data start. I mean, the data has already been there. I think you and I both already know that. You know, if you go into, if you go to these, you know, 
if you go to any like black conference or you go to any kind of like industry segment conference for like graduate students that a majority of those majority of those conferences are made up by Nigerians right mm -hmm. um, Nigerians seem to be one of the most educated um, over not even overly educated but educated um, immigrant populations across the board right mm -hmm. you're graduating doctors you're graduating MBAs you're graduating um, lawyers at a rate that no other immigrant population can touch right now right um, well, let's just, you know, for a creative exercise, let's just say that every, let's say 30% of every business person, doctor, and lawyer, right, or any other graduate, not to downplay any other graduate, like, capability, like, so a lot of, like, PhDs and engineering and all these other things, too. Let's just say 30% of the, um, you know, um, graduate and PhD candidates in, that were coming, that were Nigerian-American, went to Nigeria for five years, right? Mm -hmm. Like, that knowledge transfer and that, like, and, and, and there was a conducive, and one, there was a conducive environment for them to come back and actually do work, right? Imagine, mm -hmm. like, the re reversal we could see just in a small amount of time, right? So mm -hmm. I think what it begs, so I think it, it brings a larger question, right? Um, Wakanda was welcoming of the folks that went abroad and um, went abroad and came back. And after T'Chaka's first wife did that, T'Chaka made a common practice to send Wakanda's, Wakanda's best and brightest abroad to get an education and come back and figure out ways to advance Wakanda, right? Uh, so, so there is leadership on the, what we would quote, like fictional African side, right? To or the Wakandan, the Wakandan side to, to, to make that as a policy. But, most likely there are also resources in place for people that would come back, right, to make things mm -hmm. happen. And I think mm -hmm. so if I look at, if I, if I, like just to like focus in on um, what I mean, like I think there needs to be leadership on the African side. So, the you know, you know, and the AU has done a lot of this, but there needs to be tangible leadership on the, um, on the countryside of, you know, like places like Nigeria around how to engage with the diaspora in a very valuable way. Like it needs to be almost like, um, well, it doesn't, it doesn't almost need, but it needs to be a very um, direct, like there needs to be real policy conversations around that. And uh, programs, you know, focused on bringing the diaspora back to, to drive change and work with, um, work with people in Nigeria as well for that knowledge exchange and the idea, mm -hmm. you know, and that idea exchange, right? Um, but I think, I think there are a lot of, honestly, there are a lot of Nigerians that are willing to do that, but they mm -hmm. don't feel welcomed, right? I and, definitely know that. I've, I've heard that conversation about from people here in the United States who have just been like, how can we, you know, what can we do to um, Michael, Michael B. Jordan, in, in, who played Killmonger in the movie, even said that, like, he would love to invest in African countries. I've had a, I have a friend who is a real estate agent in, um, in, 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 in um, California who is like, he, he's, he's Yoruba, he's like, oh, I would love to invest in, in African. And I'm, and I'm just like, yeah, like, what, what, where, where's, the, where's, that, where's that gap? Where's that website that tells people, hey, you know, put in seed money, you know, like one of those, like micro lending or whatever, like put in, you know, put in seed money here and, and teach an African person how to run a business or, you know, give your time or whatever. Where, where, where's that? And so, um, so what you're saying is that that would have to be a, uh, um, a, an effort that would be in, happen with private industry as well as the government in these African countries, kind of like a joint effort. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, no, it definitely has to be a joint effort. Like we have to see – we have to see the bigger piece. We have to see the bigger piece of the pie, and the, the bigger piece of the pie at the end of the day is that we have we have a diaspora that contributes Africa in general. We have a diaspora that contributes fifty five billion dollars back to Africa every year, mm -hmm. right? We have a diaspora that's probably one of the more educated immigrant populations in the world. We have mm -hmm. a diaspora that has access to resources, access to wealth. Access to things that could be, in aggregate, could tr be transformative for countries 
in Africa. And the missing, the missing piece, is it a business opportunity to, bridge, to, to serve as a bridge? Yes. Is it a policy priority? Is it a development priority for, um, is it a, pri a, d a development priority for um, African countries to um, figure out ways to leverage this? Yes. Um, and so that's what I think the, the, lar the conversation needs to move to a larger, kind of like a larger table, right? Um, yeah. You know, people are asking questions right now, but I think it's time for people to provide answers to those things in a, in a, in a beneficial way. And here's, so for us, here's a, mm -hmm. right, go ahead. Okay, I was going to ask, um, so we're talking about government, but like here's, a, here's, a, here's something I'd like to pose, and then you let me know how realistic that is because you probably have more um, understanding of the landscape of Nigerian political, you know, infra you know the way it's set up. Um, supposing someone created, a, you know, created some type, had an idea or an initiative that they wanted to launch, that would help somebody help you. That would create make. Okay, so let's give an, a concrete example. Supposing somebody decided they were going to create an, a website or some kind of some kind of uh, infrastructure project, like a, a website combined with a you know a educational program or something like that, where it was kind of like Shark Tank style. Like, oh, I'm a you know I'm a I'm a somebody who lives in in Nigeria and I have a business idea. Um, looking for whatever, and then some Shark Tank and style American, you know, diasporic inv investors decide, hey, we want to take you under our wing. We want to, we want you to be our. And there was just this way that multiple different people could, um, in, could go through, could could go through that process. Supposing this person was not able to penetrate to the higher up, upper echelons of the Nigerian government to kind of, you know, make that work. Would it be feasible, would it be realistic for that person to go to a local government leader um, like a, you know, governor or a, you know, something in a lo some kind of local, local uh, regional leader and say, hey, we want to just work with your people, your, like, go to a bar or something like that and say, hey, we just want to work with the, with the entrepreneurs in, in your city and just test this thing out and then potentially, you know, if it works, if this, if this as a case study works out, then we can, you know, we can, we can take this to the government of the, the heads of Nigeria or something like that. Well, would, is something like that even possible in the climate in Nigeria, or is it not? It, it, anything's possible. I, and, I, and I say that in the, like, most, like, I, I say that in the most serious way. Like, and, um, and the only reason, you know, I think there are so many, there's so many organizations, there's so many funds, there's so many accelerators, so many incubators in Nigeria that you don't necessarily have to go to a government entity to work with them. The only reason I mentioned, the only reason I mentioned government in this conversation is because when you look at the type of policy priorities around research and development and life science development and, and kind of like advancing, um, you know, industries in a way that is beneficial to like the overall like integrity of uh, integrity in the markets of the country, um, those are going to take some serious investments and serious leadership, um, and that's why I took a very like that's why while I'm very much focused on there's definitely a lot of private sector conversations we can have about this, and there's definitely a lot of opportunities. But if you're looking and, and I think that's a lot of a lot of times people get this confused. Like if you're looking at like a Wakanda type situation. Um, and and this is like even based like in, in based in the comic books as well like it's very much driven from the top right um, mm. and the transformation is driven from the top um, so while you know while we can we can have conversations about like the, what private sector can do and, the, and those will be definitely fruitful but if we're looking for a transformative if we're looking to be transformative and not just you know, one-off, one-off projects or one-off programs. Um, transformation has to start at the top, and it has mm -hmm. to start at the top. Understanding that there are realistic assets outside of this country um, that can support us in a way that can be beneficial for everyone. Um, and I don't know up until now if we've really had those those type of conversations. And that's why, honestly, that's why people feel like they're not included or they feel like it's not welcoming. Um, if, 
it would be different if you had, I mean, I know the, the Ghanaian prime minister or the Ghanaian president said, you know, has, has said that often, well, many times, or many of them have said, you know, we're welcoming to the diaspora. But, you know, it'd be something different to hear that from, you know, our, you know, president in Nigeria, right? It'd be something mm-hmm. different to, you know, and then, and not just hear it, but have like policy positions in place. Like, for example, I was, um, having a conversation with, um, someone, um, that just come back from an Ethiopian diaspora fellowship, right? Um, mm-hmm. Ethiopia has a diaspora fellowship where people go, people from the diaspora come back to Ethiopia and they work in projects that are, fu- that are, um, funded by the government, right? Um, you know, those are, that's a kind of, you know, that's a kind of, those are the kind of programs that are led by the top and they're, they're pushed by the top and they have significant traction and they have significant, and they, they do significant, um, they make significant impact. Um, but that is, that's kind of what I'm talking about when I think, like when I think of government, um, Mm -hmm. but going back to your example, yeah, no, if somebody wanted to do like a Shark Tank kind of advisory service, um, um, and we can get into the merits of Shark Tank in another time, but like <laughs> if someone wanted to do a Shark Tank merit service, a uh, base service um, for, you know, African entrepreneurs, right? Like it would, it, you would probably just contact accelerators, incubators, and, you know, other co-working spaces and then, you know, use that as a channel to get companies interested. Um like it's not that hard. That that wouldn't be t- difficult at all, and you could do that without having to engage government. Uh, it'd actually be better to not engage government on that, um, and then maybe you know maybe later on you know you can do that for like a stamp of approval or something. But you know you'll find that there are a lot of ways to to do things like this in the private sector. Um, it's just um, there's not enough people thinking like this. Wow. Well, this has been an immensely enlightening conversation. I think that this is it, this is a conversation that more people need to have. Um, it's really difficult to have this type of a conversation to get this much knowledge, even in like open forum style conversations, because it's just like so much going on. But this is like um, something that I think a lot of people need. To, these this what we talked about is are things a lot of people need to hear. And I'll do my best to get this this the word out to people about this particular episode. Um, but um, I want to wrap up. Uh, are there any last words like uh, that you want to anywhere we can find you? Um, any way people can contact you, or any you know any reasons in which people should contact you, or ways. <laughs> Yeah, no. Uh, so I think uh, I'm I'm pretty active on most social media. Um, mm. Twitter is always a good place to find me, and I'm pretty responsive there uh, at Shika Umedi. Um and that's pretty standard throughout all of my um, my social media. Um, I'll be I'll be doing I'll be starting some traveling this um, probably in April. I'll be doing probably some. Um, I'll be doing some domestic travel in the United States in April. I'll be, towards the end of the month, I'll probably be in East Africa. And then I'll be in uh, Nigeria for a little while in, in May. So um, if anybody wants to just let me know, um, I'll be around for a while. So then um be around for a while. So if, if anybody's around that time, just uh, shoot me an email. Or shoot me, a, shoot me an email. Or shoot me a um Shoot me something on Twitter, and we'll we'll schedule something. Um, in terms of pro- partnering and projects, to, um, I think the best way to um, I think the best way to reach me is just uh, just sending me contact. Uh, um, just going to my contact page on chica.io. Um, I'm always interested in like cool projects. Um, any ways to collaborate? Um, any other opportunities to kind of share the story? Um, I'm always interested in things like that, so um, just shoot me, shoot me a contact, and then uh, I'll get back to you. Um, yeah, uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, I would just recommend, you know, um, you know, anybody that's thinking about starting a business in Africa or is starting a business in Africa or starting a business anywhere, you know, it's it's not easy. Nothing nothing is really easy, but you know, after a while, you know, if you push through. Um, 
in the most optimistic and idealistic terms, like you learn something and you you definitely um, have an opportunity to um, be transformative in whatever business you're going to do. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much, Chica. As always, blossom where you're planted. You have been listening to the African Growth Opportunities Podcast brought to you by Wudo.com. Wudo.com is your resource for black and evil media, merchandise, and business topics from all over the web. When search engines let you down, Wudo's got your back. Visit Wudo.com today.